Welcome, everyone. If I can just have your quick attention. So thank you for coming. It's uh, amazingly been two and a half years since we last hosted a live event at the Peninsula. And we've had uh, a multitude of webinars over the last two and a half years, um, most of which I think uh, towards the end, folks were getting a little bit tired of, of participating in. So it's nice to be live and in person and uh, with you all um, to learn. Uh, the focus of today is investment management. We have Sandeep Bhagat, who is our chief investment officer. Uh, 30 years of investment experience at various firms across the country, including Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Vanguard, and uh, it's been at Whittier for seven or eight years now. Uh, we also have Eric Darrington, who is a senior portfolio manager at Whittier. Um, he heads up our private market investing. So, um, you know, diversification on the investment side is key, both across the public markets, private markets, and obviously real estate as well. So, um, hearing from the two of them, I think, is very timely on the investment side. Uh, two and a half years ago, I mentioned that we were going to be opening our seventh office in West LA. And uh, at the time, that was, uh, I guess, a fairly aggressive statement since it took about two years from then due to the pandemic to actually open the office. But we do have the office open. Some of you have seen it. I uh, would love to have all of you come by for a visit. Um, we opened the office March 1st with uh, four people, and we are now up to 10 people. So the office is thriving, and you know, primarily because of the services we provide. So we're going to hear about investment management today, um, fiduciary services, particularly during the pandemic, and the idea of a corporate trustee uh, versus a family friend um, has really resonated with our clients. Uh, real estate services. Southern California, real estate's a key, a key item uh, for Whittier and our clients. And then as you look to philanthropy, um, folks on the west side are generally very philanthropic, and so our ability to help out with a donor advised fund, a DAF, and or help administer uh, a foundation has also resonated with our clients. And then last is family office services. Uh, Whittier is a multifamily office, um, and one of our primary goals is to work with families from an estate planning perspective, from a tax perspective, work with their financial partners with the ultimate goal of preserving and building a family's legacy and passing that legacy on to subsequent generations. And so all together, these five pillars of services um, have, again, really resonated with with clients, um, particularly on the west side. So without further ado, uh, Sandeep Bhagat will open it up and Eric will follow. Thanks again. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon. It is great to see many of you again, meet others for the first time. Boy, we live in some interesting times, right? What a difference six months can make. Uh, 2021 feels like a distant memory, and the market turmoil this year is ever so different than what we experienced last year. Just to hark back very quickly, 2021 saw this almost utopian mix of stimulative policy, low volatility, high returns, and all of that has changed in the blink of an eye. For one main reason, we have persistently high inflation. And that has caused an abrupt pivot in monetary policy and has already led to slower growth. So the Fed we know meets today, will announce their policy decision tomorrow. They have already hiked rates from zero to one and a half. Tomorrow it will be two and a quarter. They have announced a decision to reduce their balance sheet by more than 500 billion by the end of the year. Long-term rates have moved up dramatically in response to inflation and such aforementioned Fed policy. And along the way, if all of this wasn't enough, along came the war in Ukraine and lockdowns in China, 
which further pushed out the peak or the plateau in inflation. All of this has conspired to create a really hostile environment for, for stocks or risky assets. As we know stocks are down almost 20%. Bonds even, normally a safe haven, are down about 10%. So where do we stand right now? We are about to see the end of a very long cycle of easy money. And there are several implications uh, that are worthy of discussion. So today, Eric and I hope to tackle the following questions. So on inflation, how elusive will that peak in inflation be? Is it already here, perhaps? Uh, how far behind is the Fed in its tightening cycle? And more importantly, how much further does it have to go? How is, are we in a recession already? If not, how soon will we get one? How long will it last? How long will this bear market for stocks and risky assets last? And in the longer run, on the other side of this economic slowdown are even more intriguing questions. Where will inflation and interest rates settle down? What will be the risk premium for, for stocks and bonds? And importantly, Eric is then going to take a look at some secular shifts that are likely right around the corner on the horizon, things that actually won't change with a particular focus on the private markets. So look, we realize these are unprecedented times of change, challenge, and chaos, and we hope that our insights help you navigate through these troubling times. So, so let's begin with inflation and the Fed. And at the most basic level, high inflation is annoying, troublesome, because it acts as a tax and by itself can slow growth down. There are two more pervasive and, and more sinister effects. One, it can lead to policy missteps in the form of central banks engaging in overly aggressive tightening. And the second one, which has received some attention, which I'm going to draw your attention to, is that it can initiate and then propagate a dreaded wage price spiral where prices go up, workers find that they can't keep up, they ask for a wage increase, they get one, they spend it, their spending pushes prices further up, they fall short again, ask for another wage increase, spend more, prices go up. You get the idea. Can we avoid a 1970s type of wage price spiral? So let's get started. We have a lot of ground to cover, and our first deep dive is on inflation. And I just want to quickly set the stage and show you how widespread, how pervasive inflation is. And it is remarkably high, remarkably ubiquitous. No matter where in the globe you look, inflation is high. Inflation has become a global phenomenon for good reason, right? How did this all begin? We had the coronavirus pandemic which eventually set inflation off. That was global in nature. The war in Ukraine, uh, COVID policy in China, th those had global implications for supply chain logistics. No wonder it is global. Russia and Brazil need inflation up at the top. And surprisingly, the lowest inflation is encountered in Japan and China. Another glimpse of how widespread it is, let's look at components of of, of inflation. Is it lumpy or is it universally and uniformly spread out? So apologies for the busy slide. These are components of CPI inflation. I'll draw your attention to just either bookend. Look at the far left, look at the far right. At the far left, you see this big lumpy green bar. That was the increase in used car prices triggered by a shortage in semiconductor chips. And at the far right, this needs no introduction. This is all energy. And admittedly a digression, but let me quickly dwell here. We know, of course, this has been put into play by the war in Ukraine that exacerbated the situation. And so, just, so, so what, what is the implication? We know Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe, and Russia is one of the world's biggest producers of commodities. So just. Let's look at the scope of this problem and, and where the war might take us. So here's a quick picture at what Russia produces. On the far right, you see it produces 
16% of the world's natural gas, 12% of oil, 11% of wheat. And no wonder when the war began, all of these prices spiked up. They have since subsided, but they still remain elevated. And I went in this direction because the first immediate thought is, given how much of a basic necessity food and energy are, the fear now is that this is going to start affecting consumer spending, those high prices there. And I wanted to address the, those concerns head on. So here are food and energy costs as a percentage of total expenditures. Blue line shows energy, the gray line shows food and energy, and somewhat surprisingly, energy costs today make up only 4% of total spending. This is easily less than half of what it was in the 1980s. At 12% food and energy together today are less than half of what they were in the 1960s. Therefore, just a suggestion in passing, they may not have as much of an impact on spending as many might believe or fear. So let's move on to, so this is a level set, this is the inflation problem, what lies ahead, right? And I'm going to focus on a number of metrics that suggest perhaps that the worst on the inflation print might, front might be over. We know the June print for inflation was 9.1 percent. We'll anchor to that in making the following comparisons. So what do we have here? This is a measure of core inflation. Core excludes food and energy. The acronym is PCE. This is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge related to personal consumption expenditures inflation. And this is the month over month change. And I'll let you visually inspect this. But to my untrained eye, I see the following, that these last four months are at a different plateau. These are monthly changes. If I were to annualize them, I measure this at a 4% annualized rate of core inflation. By the way, the government tells us in the last print, the year-over-year -year change was 47 but more recently it seems to be running a little lower especially in comparison to what transpired the four months prior to that, where those bars annualized to between 5 and 6 percent, which is lower than these three bars that annualized to between 6 and 7 percent. So perhaps I'll pose it as a question for us to kind of collectively decide, is this a trend of deceleration? And don't get too excited because the June print, which is right around the corner at the end of this week, is suspected to be 0 0.6, it'll be this high, right where the laser pointer is. So food for thought, maybe. There might be some more compelling evidence later. And a very similar char chart refers to wage inflation. We're showing average hourly earnings. And again, not to squeeze something out that simply doesn't exist, but these last five months on average produce an annualized wage inflation rate of 4%, whereas the prior 10 months here in this range average to between 5 and 6. The last reported annual year-over-year -year change was 5%, but perhaps there is this trend of deceleration when you look underneath the surface. But we have some more compelling visuals for you, and this is very recent. So in the middle of June, something happened. There was an abrupt transition from inflation and stagflation fears to recessionary concerns. So demand destruction is already beginning to happen. And there, are some, there is some really interesting fallout from that phenomenon. Let me share a few pictures with you. Four of them, top left, this is expected inflation over the next five years. And these ex expectations have collapsed, I don't think that's too dramatic, by over 100 basis points. And now they are actually below where they were before the pandemic. So inflation concerns about the future have abated sharply. This shows gasoline futures, and I can't help but chuckle over a headline that I read on the topic. It went, gas, the price 
is mercifully running out of gas. So down more than 20%. Copper down the same amount. This is a different metric of inflation. It shows the New York Fed Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. It just shows the health of the supply chains or how constrained they are. That constriction appears to be easing. Supply chains are opening up. And what I find interesting is I made reference to demand destruction. This improvement on the supply side is now colliding in front of our eyes with weakening demand, which combination, I think, could lead to more disinflation. And then I have one kind of, this is empirical. This is what we observe. Let's draw on some theory, right? Like, is there something more concrete or more intuitive or fundamental to give us hope on the inflation front? And here, I go back to a basic tenet of monetary policy. Don't look at this chart quite yet. Just um, let me set the stage. So many, 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 many years ago, Milton Friedman taught us that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. This sounds suspiciously out of a textbook, and you say, what the hell does that mean in real life? Quite simply, it means that as goes money supply, so goes inflation. And that's what we are showing here. The blue line shows changes in money supply growth year over year. The green line shows inflation, specifically consumer price inflation, also on a year over year basis. I'll let your eyes rest on it, but before we try to interpret it, I want to offer up two foundational principles, but a very important caveat. So as elegant or reasonable as the proposition sounded, a big controversy or debate in financial circles was this relationship between money supply and inflation actually seemed to have broken down. In fact, if you look at the last 30 years, just prior to this episode, you could de detect every time money supply went up, inflation was conspicuous in its absence. We saw money supply grow during the global financial crisis, no inflation. So there is a little bit of controversy around that, but this is still somewhat compelling. And so your two foundational principles are, we know monetary policy works on a lagged basis. From the time something happens to money supply or Fed funds rates, it takes six or 12 months for its effect to flow through the real economy. Number two, we know fiscal stimulus, which we saw a lot of, has both a more immediate and a bigger impact on inflation. And I can't help shake the suspicion off that this big spurt, while it doesn't entirely explain the increase in inflation, you had pent up demand, supply chain disruptions, we spoke to a couple of these, those all played a role, but so did money supply to some extent. So almost on cue, this goes up, on a lagged basis, so does inflation, driven by money supply along with other things. But money supply has cratered in the last 12 months. And should that lagged effect play out, I might submit that its full impact on inflation going forward may not have been felt yet. So if you're getting kind of excited or optimistic that inflation could be rolling over, I have two more restraining um, uh, observations to kind of uh, make this more realistic. The war in Ukraine isn't going to end anytime soon. So inflation may roll over, but it's not going to descend very rapidly. And if you look underneath it, goods inflation has subsided, but now we are being influenced by service inflation, which includes wages and rents, and those tend to be stickier. So yes, bottom line view, we may have peaked. We are probably plateauing, should begin to recede, not as rapidly as where it went up. So for the bulk of this year and next, it will be above target levels, but not nearly as sinister as what people had feared. So where does that leave the Fed and, and what is its position and posture? So the Fed was universally and rightfully condemned for being too late, right? So the question is, just how late are they? If you're at one and a half and inflation was 9%, my God, this is so hopeless that it's not even worthy of a conversation. You're totally incompetent, one might suggest or fear. And so, so we, we are right, they were misguided. 
It was their misguided belief that inflation would be transient that has led them into this pickle. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. Right now, they try to control inflation. They risk a recession. If they try to avoid a recession, they risk an inflationary spiral that can last for many, many years. So what do they do? The Fed has three big questions in front of it. Or about the Fed, I'll try to answer three questions. Just how late are they? Is it truly hopeless? Uh, what should they do if they go on their current path? They will invert the entire yield curve. Soon enough, their policy rate will be higher than the 10-year bond rate, which normally has been a very strong precursor to a recession. Do they go ahead and do that, or can they afford to pause or possibly pivot in the fourth quarter? So let's begin to answer uh, those questions. And my first answer is they're not as late as you might think for two reasons. Number one, they haven't succeeded in keeping inflation down and they were admittedly rate, but along the way, they used one of the tools at their disposal. It's called forward guidance. They kept communicating with you about what they were going to do. So everybody knows that the Fed's plans include seven more 25 basis point hikes until December and the reduction of 500 billion on the balance sheet is tantamount to another one or two rate hikes. That is all known to us, and the markets price that in. So the world is operating under the belief that the Fed funds rate will be between three and a quarter and three and a half. The one and a half or the two and a quarter from tomorrow is largely irrelevant, and you can see that evidence here. So interest rates have gone up here in the blue line as a result, so has the dollar, and stock prices have declined. This combination of higher rates, stronger dollar, and lower stock prices has the effect of slowing the economy down. So they are not late, it's the, this is happening. And the other reason, the other argument to diffuse right away is many, perhaps in the room or at least in the business, believe that, are you kidding me? You're not gonna be able to stop at three, three and a quarter, three and a half. If you just look at principles of monetary theory, you, in order to quell inflation, you have to take short rates of the Fed funds rate above inflation. So no matter where you peg inflation, 9% headline or 5% core inflation at the moment, Fed funds rate, in theory, need to be at 5 6 or 7% for them to truly fight inflation. And I want to counter that by saying, this would be true if today's inflation problem was all about demand, but we are where we are today because of both demand and supply, and the supply solution will come from the private sector with China reopening now, that should ease the burden, and at some point the world will operate like the pandemic is truly behind us. So I don't see that draconian scenario where Fed funds need to go up to 5% or, or higher. What about the pause and pivot uh, possibility? So here is just a quick glimpse. The F Fed is projecting that they'll be at 3.4% at the end of December. These green bars, I apologize, they're already outdated. Mar these are market expectations. They change so much, literally by the hour, that we could be drawing these over and over and over again. So these market expectations have come down. But this is noteworthy. Just focus on this bar. A lot of, there's a lot of information and everything I'm saying. If they get here, they would be well up. The 10-year bond is at 2.8%. At 3.4, the Fed funds rate 10-year part of the yield curve will be handily inverted. Right? So does the Fed go out and underwrite that, that recession is the big question. And so what, what should it do? While they haven't succeeded in keeping inflation down, they have been successful in keeping inflation expectations down. We saw that in the earlier charts. They remain anchored. They remain anchored because they've been hawkish all along, and I believe they need to continue to do that. So do the 75 tomorrow, maybe do your 50, but by November or December, just fast forward, put yourself in that position. What, what could happen at that point of time? By then, July, August, September, October, four months of inflation data will have been printed and registered. And if those declines come to fruition, at in November or December, the Fed may have room to pause. And it might be a better option than for them to continue to hike rates, trigger the big recession, then go and cut rates 
soon enough, sometime next year, like the market is projecting. The market is projecting interest rate cuts next year. This is exactly what happened in the 70s, where expectations came unanchored when they pivoted and eased, and they can avoid that by not overshooting and just pausing in time to reassess. Food for thought, the, the concerns about the Fed destroying the economy may not yet come to pass. So what else should we look at? Um, there's a fear that higher interest rates will crater the housing market. Home prices are high. Rates have gone up. Mortgage rates have gone up. Affordability is low. This is the increase in mortgage rates. This is the cost of funding a mortgage based on higher home prices and higher mortgage rates. This looks suspiciously like 2008, but not to worry. In rapid fire mode, four reasons why this is not a repeat of 2008. Number one, home prices are supported by supply demand fundamentals. Supply is low. We had two months of supply on the market that has gone up to three months, but it's way lower than the 10 months. Uh, adjustable mortgage rates are a small percentage of all mortgages, less than 10% compared to 35 back here. Uh, borrowers are more credit worthy. Mortgages are being originated at higher credit scores and household debt to income ratios are extremely low. What about the impact of high interest rates on corporations and the interest expense, expense and payments that they make? Let's take a quick look at that. And boom, wah, we went old school here. We're giving you a black and white chart. But it's still instructive nonetheless. This shows how corporate debt is spread out by maturity at the far left. About 13% is truly short term. It's variable. But more than 30% of corporate debt is 10 years or longer. And what it means is this will get attract the higher interest payment, but when money was abundant and easy, a lot of companies, much like you with your homes, they refinanced their debt and pushed it out. They've locked in low rates for a very long time with the result that, I mean, this might surprise you. This is the past. This is what happened in the GFC. The dotted line is BAA corporate bond yields, right? They, zig and zag, they move around, but the average interest paid because the range of maturities is so wide and so distributed, doesn't change a whole lot. These exogenous shocks don't materially affect uh, uh, interest payments. And just to quickly close out, uh, and I want to make sure Eric has enough time to go over his segment, from this point on I'm going to go in even at an even faster pace. A couple of things in the first half were very unusual. Lending hope that should the recession happen, it'll be of the short and shallow variety. Here is what we observed. We know GDP in the first quarter was negative. There is an analogous measure of economic activity. It's called gross domestic income. It measures income receipts that come in the form of wages, profits, and taxes to individuals, corporations, and the government. And that measure was handily in positive territory, very un-recession-like. Employment was remarkably strong. So even as GDP is faltering, we added 2.7 million new jobs. Again, lending belief that there are some strong underlying fundamentals that will continue to support the US economy. So what are some takeaways here? Yes, the market has all but priced in a recession. Whether we avoid it by a whisker or get one, the big question is will it be short and shallow or will it be uh, deep and protracted? And we suggest that it might be of the short and shallow variety. Uh, another headwind to, 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 to the backdrop here is the strength in the dollar. We know it negatively impacts earnings. We show that in this picture. This gold line is inverted. This suggests a stronger dollar. Along with it, you see weaker earnings. In my 30 years of business, a strong dollar does the following. It, by the way, it reduces the, uh, the price of imported goods and lowers domestic inflation. It has a negative impact on earnings. To what extent? Every 10% move in the dollar reduces inflation by a quarter percent, reduces GDP by three quarters of a percent, and earnings by two and a half percent. 
So how bad an impact will this have, especially as companies are reporting earnings as we speak right now? Earnings estimates have held up remarkably well. This 248 number for earnings in 2023 was 251. It has cracked, it has come down a bit. But you have to say for all the doom and gloom of a current recession or an imminent one, this is remarkably healthy. And so from this point on, in terms of the depth of the bear market, the things to focus on are really on the earnings front. How much lower will earnings become? And I'm going to suggest that the equity downside for those who are focused on it will be influenced by what is the, the lowest possible PE multiple that we will see in this cycle or the low level, lowest level of earnings. We believe PE multiples will remain 14 times or higher. Earnings will not go below 200 and without while sparing you all the gory details, using different combinations of potential earnings level, we, these are my bear, base, and bull case scenarios. They look awfully symmetric. Everything is spaced out by 400 points. The space between the two, the range inside each scenario, where I'm different than the consensus is that I expect this outcome to be less likely than this outcome. If you pressed me for numbers, I would say this is 20% more likely, 35, 45. And so in two minutes, I'm going to give you a glimpse of <laughs> some longer term trends on the other side of this slowdown. We're done with kind of a short term outlook. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that we talked about inflation. It's high. We, in the last 50 years, we have seen these three regimes will we stay stuck here at 8%. Like in the 70s, will we see the 2% that we did after global financial crisis or the 3% in between? This scenario is far more likely. This was a cyclical low because there was a lot of deleveraging. We just don't see the ingredients for this to persist in this cycle. Uh, interest rates were negative. The green bars show that real rates were negative in the last 10 years. They were positive in the 10 years prior to the last uh, 10 years, and we think that the next 10 years will also have positive real interest rates. I'm going to skip this chart in the interest of time. Draw your attention to equity valuations being healthy because I see us getting below 4% on inflation in the next 6, 9, or 12 months. And at that time, equities will be reasonably well supported. And so the world going forward will look a lot normal. Inflation around 3%, Fed funds rate around 3%, Treasury bond yields between 3 and 4 real GDP will subside to between 1.5% and 2%, earnings will grow 6 to 10 These are the multiples that are likely. These are ranges of stock market returns, bond market returns, and this 4 to 5% range is the extent to which stocks will do better than bonds. In many ways, this is very similar to historical averages. And so my positive, cautiously optimistic message is the world is not coming to an end. A recession is quite likely, if we see it, it will be short and shallow as early as the next three, six, or nine months. But we should soon get beyond that by the time we meet again next year or uh, before the end of next year. And so, Eric, I'm going to get you ready. We're going to talk about some of the likely shifts that will take place in private markets. And one of the themes that we expect will not change is high quality growth. But to tell us all about it is Eric. Thank you, sir. OK. So you just heard Sandeep tell you about the fact that the end of easy, about the end of easy money. And the question is, is what does that mean for private markets on the forward? So I'm going to talk to you about kind of, you know, how has easy money manifested itself within private markets? Talk to you a little bit about what we're seeing kind of in real time, uh, some thoughts about how we're transitioning, and hopefully leave you with some ideas about, you know, things that, uh, some ideas that you can actually uh, think about where to deploy capital. The first thing I want to do, though, is actually like level set, right? So, you know, what are private markets? Uh, a lot of times people talk about private markets, alternatives, 
Uh, they, they talk about them like they're these, mag these magical creatures that aren't subject to you know, all of the economic forces that Sandeep just talked to you about. In fact, if you think about what VC calls companies that reach a valuation of over a billion dollars, we call them unicorns. In public markets, we just call them small caps, right? So th the thing about private markets and about private market investing is that it's not really doing anything different. It's just that we're doing it in, you know, it's private investments in private companies and the loans that we go into them. So what has gone on in terms of private markets? How big are they? What are they? If you look at this chart on the right, what you see is that since 2010, the overall amount of capital that's gone into uh, private markets, when measured as a percentage of GDP, actually is comparable to the massive increase that we saw in the flows into mutual funds during the 1990s. Right? So this is, we reached all-time highs last year, and this was more true in venture than anywhere else. Right? So the chart that you're looking at here says 2021, $341 billion raised versus the 41 you know, just 10 years prior. Right, so you're talking about an eight-fold increase in the amount of money that went into uh, venture capital specifically. 50% increase just last year in the number of deals that were uh, done, uh, or almost 50%, year over year. I can tell you that the number of new companies that got funded and the number of people that were raising capital all throughout the year just felt frantic the entire, the entire year, right? If you look at the rounds, so just focus your eye, um, I realize the mic is moving, but if you focus your eye on the top line here, these are late, the, that's late stage, right? Like these are pre-IPO companies. And what you see is just in the, in the last year, in 2021, so talking about how much liquidity came into this space, you saw valuations on average deal size go up by 50%. You saw overall uh, uh, median valuations uh, also go up by 50%. And this happened in private equity too, right? So the chart you're looking at here, this is a combination of various uh, private markets. And the chart on the right is uh, the overall valuations that we saw. So in 2021, not only did we actually eclipse the 2007 uh, you know, total deal size in, in terms of private equity that had been raised, we increased, again, almost 50%. And then you look at the, the valuations that the, this money was deployed at, you can see on average it was about 11.4 times, right? And, and that's substantially higher than what we'd seen in previous years. One of the things to know about private equity, right, is that private equity is, so while venture is investing in private companies that are not typically profitable and are trying to grow and, you know, and, and do new things, private equity is investing in companies that are you know, stable, produce cash flow, and most of those companies are bought with a combination of, of cash uh, or, or equity and, and debt. So this lower line that you see here is the debt line. But let's talk about what's been going on in the debt market. First of all, let's level set how big it is. So the, the amount of lending that goes into private markets, either you know, broadly syndicated loans, um, direct lenders, uh, is $1.6 trillion. So what's $1.6 trillion? Well, it's the same size as the total debt that is in all of small cap publicly traded companies. Right? So it's, 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 a very large, uh, it's, it's a very large number. The th other thing you'll see on this chart is if you focus on the bottom, you see that, that, that the overall quality of the loans that are getting done or the companies that are borrowing has been going down, right? Roughly 50% of the loans that were done were essentially the lowest grade that we're looking at here. On top of the companies not being as high quality, the loans aren't as high quality. So what this chart is showing you is that the number of covenants, the people who are lending the money into this market, have, have the restrictions or the things that they expect of the people that are paying them, uh, supposed to pay them back, has just gotten less and less in terms of what they, you know, the what do we call EBITDA covenants or, co covenants or cash flow covenants, their ability to cover their, their debt service, right? So these, uh, the overall quality of loans has gone down. And when Sandeep talked about the, uh, you know, he showed you the chart and how much of the debt that has been issued is out past 2032. That is not the case in private equity, right? Private equity debt is all floating rate, which if you're lending in a rising interest rate environment, that feels good. You get a 300 basis point increase in, uh, uh, in, in Fed funds, that means the rate that you're getting paid goes up by 3%. The problem is for the companies, right? A lot of these companies are not really built to withstand a 300 basis point shock in their borrowing costs. There are going to be companies here that do not come out the other side of this looking the same way that they did when they borrowed the money. So that's, that's kind of the level set, just showing you how much money has flown into the private markets. Now we're going to look at Kind of where, you know, so we, we looked at a bunch of things. We're going to look at where things are on the forward. 
Um, I was talking to a client about this the other day, and she goes, okay, so what you're telling me is that we've been mainlining capital for the last 10 years, so what does sobering up look like? So, so far, where are we? Uh, you, we talk, this is only through May, but you see that the S&P was down 20%, and the venture market is down over 50%. If you were to go and look at this, you know, just post-IPO companies going back to like, there's plenty of them that are down 70, 80%. Like, okay. You'd think you'd see this in, in private markets as well. Same chart, added a year. It's a little tricky because it's only through May, right? So it's not a, a direct comparison. But what you can see is that the number of deals getting done are still pretty healthy. And what I'll show you in the next chart, and the, and the overall values, while lower, are, are still pretty, ro you know, pretty robust. You look at the, the deal size, it's come down a little bit. So that's that blue dot, the you know, 14 versus 15 and a half. The other thing you see is that, uh, but the valuations have continued to grow. Exactly. Well, it's like, why in the world would valuations still be going up in, the, in an environment where I just showed you that the public comps, the companies that just IPO'd 20 minutes ago, are all down 50%. We saw the same thing in private equity. You saw the overall, the, the overall number of deals have gone down dramatically, but if, again, on the right, you're looking at the multiple that was paid, it's an all-time high. We're over 12 times in terms of what people are doing. I, th I think there's a lot of noise in the data, but one of the, oops, there's a lot of noise in the data, but I think that what you're seeing and what we'll talk about in a second is, first of all, there's a lot of rollover from what took place you know, in 2021, so deals that have been committed to just sort of you know, still got done. Um, but the other thing that we'll talk about in a second is just how, um, you know, some of the numbers can be a little bit uh, misleading and what we think we're actually seeing in real time. Higher borrowing costs. I mean, this is, this is pretty, pretty evident, but I'll come back to it thinking about like what our opportunity set is. But trying to think about what it is in the magnitude of what, uh, you know, these increases are. And a 200 basis point increase in the cost of, uh, in, in the cost of their debt is something that it will you know, lower EBITDA for these companies by 10%. I mean, th these are material impacts that uh, the, you know, the companies are not really well positioned to, uh, to survive. So where are they gonna get liquidity? Borrowing costs are up. You know, the, uh, the IPO window is, is closed, right? There's nobody's, nobody's going and IPOing at this point. And so when people are going to raise capital, or if people need capital to you know, continue to build or to grow, where are they gonna get it? People have still been able to, so going back to you, like people have still been able to go and find financing. What this, is, what this chart is showing you is in the venture world, how many, you know, how many of the uh, equity raises that are going on are at a lower price than they were before. So this is what we call down rounds, right? So if you raised, uh, I'll give you a great example actually. So um, uh, there was, so Acorns, right? Just earlier this year, raise money at a $2 billion valuation. Headline says, TPG leads round 300 million to go into, uh, you know, to invest in uh, Acorn at you know, a $2 billion valuation. What that headline doesn't tell you <laughs> is that they came into it and in exchange for that $300 million, because the, the company Acorns had failed, had, had planned to go public via SPAC, now they needed capital. The liquidation, the TPG was able to give them money, but uh, make sure that they got a liquidation preference. So it's a liquidation preference in, in structure. They put in $300 million, but they have to get 450 back before anybody below them makes any money. On top of that, they're getting a 5% dividend, and there's other forms of structure in the deal that are, that are basically crammed everybody down. Headline says valuation, or said that the market value went up. We're seeing this across the board, right? So people who are extending rounds and saying, oh, it's at the same price, are not allowing for the fact that what's really going on is that there's structure and there's people that are coming with capital are you know, protecting you know, their subsequent investment. Uh, we had a, one of our venture managers uh, in the other day and I asked him, I said, tell me what, you know, like what is the current state of uh, late stage VC? And the very first slide he put up was a picture of a dumpster fire. <laughs> so, you know, so where does that, I mean, what does that mean in terms of kind of opportunity, right? So I just described a situation where we've seen a ton of capital flow into private markets. Uh, we know that private markets are still subject to the same, you know, forces that public markets are. But where, where are you going to find opportunity? Like, what, is, you know, what does it mean for you to do? And one of the ways that we think about this is looking at what's going on in VC. And this, what the chart you're looking at here is uh, a chart looking at what are called secondaries. So 
what's a secondary? So if you are an investor in you know, Sequoia Fund 13 and you, wanna, and you wanna go sell it, you have to go to somebody who is, you know, who, who's willing to buy it because these are non-public markets, right? These are private, so it's a private transaction. And the prices that people are willing to pay you know, have, uh, have started to come down. I asked him, I said, so what, is the, you know, what do you think of you know, the actual clearing price is? It's like, well, the bid-ask spread, the difference between what somebody is willing to sell something for and what somebody is willing to pay for it right now is, is astronomical, right? Like there is, so a lot of the things that um, you see, it's like the, the, things aren't really getting done at a lot of these prices, right? Unless you need liquidity. <laughs> if you need liquidity, these are the prices, right? And so the opportunity set on the forward is certainly that, I, you know, I think there's a good chance within, specifically within venture, the opportunity set to buy things at a substantial discount is, is going to be comparable to what we saw sort of after the, the, the 01, the dot com, uh, dot com blow up. But you have to keep in mind, right, 19, nine, June of 99 is when Google was funded, right? So you saw dot com blow up, but it doesn't mean that there aren't high quality companies that are out there that are ultimately going to be market leaders. Right, so th this is both an opportunity and just something that you know keep in keep in the back of your mind. So, what did we you know in summary? What did we talk about? So, easy money isn't easy anymore. What does it mean? Well, it means that uh, company you know ideas or investments that require the ability to get refinanced at lower interest rates is done. Right, kicking down kicking the can down the road is done. Quality matters. You, you know, we talked about quality. We talked about quality growth. But how do we think about quality? It can be a number of things, right? You think about companies that have pricing power. We talked about the inflation scenario, right? You talk about businesses that are able to pass through inflation costs because of their, uh, their relationship with their customers. But it can also talk about the managers that we invest with, right? There's a lot of people who are out there doing things that the reason that they look smart is because they've been using a lot of leverage and there's been no, you know, there's always been an ability to kind of refinance their, their, their way out of it. Uh, you know, a good example of this is you know, you would think that uh, going and lending money against real estate at a 60% LTV is, you know, it's like, hey, this is great. You're going to pay me 10%. It's transitional. You know, it's a transitional loan. Uh, there's plenty of collateral. But what you, don't, what you don't understand in that scenario is that there's actually a lot of cost to potentially taking the keys of, of that asset. And so having a high-quality manager in a situation like this or when you're thinking about how you're think of, you know, deploying, Right? You want to know that you have money with somebody who's capable of taking the keys and is capable of monetizing you know, that, that difference right? between the, the, the value of the capital and the, and the loan. I said be a liquidity provider. So I, I showed you one example of that, which is, you know, I, I think, secondary markets, both specifically in, uh, in VC, but just generally your uh, capital mar uh, secondary markets. But the other is going to be in distress or solution capital. Right, you think about, um, there was a situation about a decade ago where uh, the city of Chicago wasn't able to uh, you know, borrow as much money as, it, I mean, there was basically a big budget crisis and they, were able, they needed capital to pay their bills. They, had, they owed money to people, they were receivables going back 18 months that they were behind on. And so the legislature passed a, a law that said, hey, you need to you know, pay current on this, pay these people that you owe money at least 1%. And so somebody was smart enough to go around and pull these receivables together and turn it into, you know, turn it into a solution that allowed the city of Chicago. But now you're getting 12%, uh, you're getting 12 interest on something where Chicago was still borrowing in the you know, 5 6% uh, range at that time. So being thoughtful, being a solution provider, and you think about the distress market, we don't need a recession for there to be a lot to do in, in distress or in, or in solution capital. I just told you that the size of the, the debt market is $1.6 trillion. And the only thing that has to happen is that companies have to like, cease being able to simply refinance that at cheaper and cheaper levels. There are great companies that are going to get restructured, the whole like, you know, great company, bad balance sheet. That's, that's going to be an opportunity on the, on the forward. So, and then just being flexible. There's a lot of things that people like, tend to think of as just being in a box. Like, I only do this, I only do that. But I gave that example as it related to the, you know, the muni market. You have to be with managers or people that you know, are creative thinkers and are providing solutions. Capital solutions, you know, it really, quality hasn't even mattered and a lot of the solution you know, set hasn't mattered because so much capital has been available. It, you know, there was no reason to distinguish. Anybody can get financed. 
In an environment where not everything works and not everything can get financed, the, the flexibility uh, is going to be paramount. So I'm good. Questions? Yeah. So we'll take your questions with a caveat. I'll take all the easy ones <laughs> and make sure the <laughs> tough ones go to Eric. And Eric, if I could just quickly advance this. I'll, we covered a lot of ground, right? There were macro predictions, micro, in the weeds at 30,000 feet. I'm going to leave this up on the screen. You can kind of reflect on these. Maybe that sparks a question or two. But fire away because there is so much going on. What's on your mind? Thanks. Um, as I'm looking at your numbers, and I have a friend who does a lot of bankruptcy work, yep. there haven't been as many bankruptcies as one might expect over the past two years. But looking at your credit numbers and all of that, the interest rates going up, what are you predicting with respect to bankruptcies? I think that's for him, not for you, because you said he gets the hard ones. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it was really hard. I, <laughs> don't even ask me to spell bankruptcy. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the obvious answer to that is that there's absolutely you do not need an actual res uh, recession, let alone a severe recession or a massive deleveraging in order to have an increase in bankruptcy from what we've seen, right? There have been almost no bankruptcies because everybody could just get bailed out, kicking the can down the road. There is no more kicking the can down the road. Like, that's, that's the part of it that's over. So, I mean, magnitude, like, that really depends, obviously. But I would just say that the, uh, you know, if you look at the structure that I showed you in terms of the quality of the companies and their ability to service debt and the, the overall level of increase, that there's going to be a lot more companies that, that face that. Yeah, it's those things. It's the quality of the business, right? Like a lot of these businesses are, you know, the reason that the debt structure worked was simply because interest rates were so low. So debt coverage ratios worked, right? And they're, they're just not going to be able to grow into their business plan. They're not going to be able to achieve a plan, and interest rates will ultimately, you know, exceed their ability to service the debt. So. I'll just say, look, public markets get marked to market literally on a tick-by-tick -tick basis. So you know exactly where they stand. Private market investments, you get a new price when there is a new transaction or a new round of funding. So for those that are still claiming higher valuations, just beware that there's a lot, lot of downside still yet to be revealed. In the numbers. Yeah. In the back. The lack of domestic, domestic oil um, production, or should I say drilling, as caused by the current administration, and which is also putting roadblocks in front of the existing oil companies and forcing the United States to buy oil from overseas countries, many of whom are not even our friends, and um, is a direct cause, in my opinion, uh, one of the direct causes of many factors of the higher inflation. And what are your thoughts on that, on the lack of domestic oil production and drilling by the current administration, not talking about politics, just business reality. That's yeah, a tough so, one. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is a really slippery slope because no matter how hard you t try, there is an underlying politic, a current on political ideology, which I will do my best to refrain from. Uh, so you are absolutely right that our Energy independence that we had achieved and then s kind of have since given up leaves us more vulnerable to imported oil and we are more affected by the, and, and by the way, Europe is finding out <laughs> in a much bigger magnitude what it means to be overly dependent on outside sources. So I can't disagree with you. See, like a good politician, I use two negatives so you have no idea what, I can't disagree with you that it, had, it has clearly played a role. So you're talking of energy policy. I suspect our foreign policy may have kind of slipped in rigor or, or severity or you know, being staunch, and that might have emboldened Putin. So I'll, I'll offer these up acutely aware that there is a political fallout from all this, which I really don't want to kind of get tangled up with. But yeah, some of our problems have been a bit self-inflicted, if that's where you're going. Can I just 
Thank you, sir. Hi. Um, it's on. I've, I've invested, you know, in my life, stocks, bonds, whatever. Are you suggest? But I've never invested in private equity. Sure. Are you suggesting that where does private equity in, fit into our portfolios in the real world? And would you suggest it for older people who have retired, are looking, you know, <laughs> looking at the end? Yeah. Um, where, where would that fit in to a typical a Typical portfolio. portfolio. I mean, it's obviously tricky to answer because the specifics of your situation and liquidity and needs for that really like fit in. But I think one of the things to answer that question is just think about the size of the of the market. I mean, clearly, more you know, companies have been staying uh, private for a lot longer. Part of that's because they've had access to capital to to do so. Um, and so I think you know, returns from private equity and returns in VC certainly leading up to the you know the environment that we're in or you know, even prior to the massive spike that we just saw. Um, there's a reason that people invest in private equity and returns have been stronger than what you get from, from public markets. It comes with additional illiquidity. It comes with, you know, a fair different, you know, sets of risks. Um, but I think the answer to that question at the end of the day still comes down to the quality of the, uh, the managers that you're partnering with, right, as to whether or not it's a good idea. Um, if you take an environment like right now, I think identifying managers that are you know, specifically targeting high quality businesses, have, you know, don't tend to over lever, are people that are good liquidity providers, um, mean, you know, known to be capable of closing deals, right? Like they're a known quantity that people are gonna come to. Like they're gonna see better deal flow, they're gonna see better opportunities, things are gonna be cheaper. So, I mean, committing right now to high quality managers, I mean, you could end up in some of the best vintages that they have. So, I mean, I would think that, and I specifically, I mean, VC, secondary, private equity, Again, having that sort of knowledge about who's gotten primed, <laughs> who's you know who's got where is their value within the capital stack, where you know these things are are important, and I think there's a fair bit of opportunity there. Um, I think your overall liquidity situation and sort of the long term, you know, where you want your money to go long term, and what you know one of the things that we talk about is because our clients are multi generational, is you know you might be thinking about investing based on your lifetime but your money has a lifetime beyond yours, right? And so that's, that is the way that we think about it in terms of like, who is the ultimate recipient of the, of the capital and how do you like position it for, the, you know, for that end goal? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, a lot to digest, but one of your key, um, I think, premises was um, you could s moderate inflation by increasing supply um, of certain key things like oil and grain. The reality is there's only so much oil we could access and there's only so much grain that can be shipped and both of those may continue to be restricted for reasons outside of our control. So what happens to your predictions if we have continued um, supply restrictions on oil and grain? Hmm. Look, we highlighted that it was semiconductor chip shortage at one end of the spectrum and then the disruption to commodity markets, prices, and their own supply chains that have played a big role. I'm looking at a world at some point, and maybe it's a year out, maybe it's two, maybe it's a little longer, but at some point, there should be normalcy to these markets. And that's the help from the private sector through the reopening continued reopening and the easing of supply chains that will be an ally and a partner to the Fed. I'm suggesting the Fed is not solely responsible. God help us all if they had to bring inflation, headline inflation from nine or core inflation from five or six down to target, that would be Herculean and Fed funds rates would be at seven or eight. But on an optimistic note, this is there are two sides to this. We are here because of both demand and supply issues, and the solution to the supply issue will be geopolitical in nature to some extent, and it will come from the private sector. Companies will innovate, they will reshore, they will rid themselves of this supply chain nightmare that came about because of public health safety considerations 
from a once in a century pandemic. So I'm looking at the glasses half full, but <laughs> perhaps that's overly optimistic. What else? We must have said something else that was incredibly controversial. <laughs> ah. Hi, thank you, great presentation. Um, you know, understanding what's happening as far as the government making investments in America, um, we, we looked at a pretty aggregate uh, set of data here across the globe, but you know, we see that in order to um, you know, rid ourselves of, uh, of supply chain dependencies of, of, of ch from China, we're making a lot of big investments uh, made in America. Um, Samsung just announced a $100 billion project in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Uh, we are subsidizing as a government, we're subsidizing a lot of semi -chip, uh, se semiconductor chips. Uh, are there any specific industries that A, didn't exist in the past that are now existing that you've considered um, deploying capital into? Or are there any particular um, categories or industries that you know, you're bullish about considering the state of affairs in America and the rest of the world? Okay, so we got the public market perspective, maybe the private market. I'll take a shot here. So we love this theme of high quality growth into which would fall companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple. And they all got punished because the surge in inflation caused rates to go up. And those companies tend to have higher valuations that compressed, right? We think a lot of the damage on the inflation and interest rate sides or at least more than half of the damage may have been done already. And so we are kind of intrigued by a more attractive entry point into those names. We think those are great vehicles with which to compound wealth. They're not going to go out of business. They are incredibly good companies. And they're cheaper now. So that's one opportunity that we see. Uh, we are very mindful of valuation, so it's easy to get carried away with components of the new economy, AI, big data, machine learning, uh, automation, robotics. We're intrigued by it, but in this intersection of a secular theme that will persist, that's not going anywhere, with high quality of management, the product itself, valuations, putting it all together, we're looking for that intersection of thematic investing and basic fundamentals to add to investment in client portfolios. And Eric, uh, what would you add to that? Yeah, no, I think there's a bunch of things there. I mean, you could go a lot of different ways answering that question. I, I think there's gonna be a lot of interesting opportunities as it relates to the financing of, of those things that you're talking about, right? Whether it's like public-private partnership kind of things in and around. Um, there's a lot of interest in the muni market in, uh, in ways of, uh, of, of funding that. Um, I think that, you know, you talked about sort of the, the trends and whether it's, I think automation and artificial intelligence are areas that, you know, can, not only do they continue to innovate, we're already seeing lots of innovation take place, even in public companies, right? Like Deere, I mean, basic, I mean it's not specifically related to chip infrastructure, but it does kind of talk about like, you know, grain pricing on, on some level. They're basically, you know, Using, uh, they're using uh, automation and AI to like bas to drive combines up and down and uh, you know and, and basic you know farm. Um, I, I think that that sort of theme or that concept is something that's going to play out in lots of different areas and, and ways. And there's you know so like there's just a lot of tangential uh, opportunities kind of around that. Um, so. So how about we do this? We are mindful of your time. You've been very generous and attentive. We take one last question and then perhaps get you on your way. Yes, sir. The venture capital marketplace appears to be at a near death moment. Unlike what happened during the dot com bust, we had two mega investors, Tiger and SoftBank that put prices into an absurd, <coughs> unsustainable level. Now we have ventured down 70%. We have managers, many of these funds have a 20% third interest. They will never see. Right. What is the future of the venture capital marketplace? 
I, I, you know, I go back to like the, the joke about mainlining capital and sobering up. I think that's the, that's the future of, of that market is that the belief that there was unending capital and that you could simply pursue growth at all costs and that profits never mattered and that you didn't have to worry about whether or not you could convert from growing to generating cash flow is a, a thing of the past. There are plenty of funds that will never, uh, that will never see carry, but there's a lot of good companies still within a lot of those, those funds. And so one of the things that you're, you will see is restructuring at, of the funds themselves. <laughs> um, we, I mean, we've seen that in the past. We'll, we'll see it certainly again. And it's not the first time that we've experienced this. It did happen after dot-com, and it did happen again after the financial crisis, where you know, what you said took place, where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of companies that have been funded that, and funds that just were never gonna, see, uh, never gonna see carry. But I think your point about Tiger and SoftBank, I mean, I showed you the chart, right? I mean, the number of, Tiger was completing a deal like every 45 minutes. It was insane. And um, just the franticness of it. I think that that's done, but I don't know that the, uh, the long-term nature of venture investing and investing in innovation is, you know, is, is itself uh, dead. So. Of course not. I'm directing the question for the efficacy of going for new funds mm. with great investors that have moved out of those old funds those old funds are trapped. And wouldn't you want to be with great people that are now in newer, untrapped funds? Mm -hmm. I understand the question. I, th I, would, I mean, I don't think that you can go investing in, uh, in venture with, you know, just categorically, right, to your point. Um, it's the example that I gave kind of about like the TPG example. You need to know where the economics are, and you need to understand ultimately what the underlying, what the underlying companies are, and what you, what you hold. Uh, the GP economics sort of, you know, be damned, as it were. Because the thing you have to remember is, like, most of these things are owned by lots of people. It's not like private equity where there's one controlling investor. So it's more about the underlying company within the fund than it is the fund themselves. I think. So, so with your permission, maybe I can elevate this to a higher level of asset allocation and portfolio construction. And it has kind of long been held that the true risk return characteristics of private, in invest, private market investments don't come through, especially because valuations and marks to market values tend to be smoothed out. They're infrequent and periodic and episodic. And these large drawdowns will again highlight some of the risks in private equity and venture capital that one may not normally appreciate. It will be a bit of a rude awakening. And then how they fit into that broad portfolio, as the lady was asking, would perhaps receive another rethink, maybe with smaller allocations to these types of asset classes. So, Yeah, thank you very much for pretending we'll be around.